Well, this fall, as we started last Sunday, we're looking at what are called the Psalms of Ascents. There were songs that were sung by travelers as they went up to Jerusalem to worship God. And so as we're looking at these psalms, I I want us to consider how they help us to see ourselves in our relationship to God and how that can enable us to rise above our circumstances and to reflect him more clearly. So this week, I want to look at three psalms, Psalm 122, 125, and 132. And I'm just going to read portions of each one for now. Um, But as you're able, as we open God's word together, I invite you to stand. I'll just read a couple of verses from Psalm 122 and 125, and then a little bit longer section from 132. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. The Lord swore an oath to David, a sure oath he will not revoke. One of your own descendants I will place on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and the statutes I teach them, then their sons will sit on your throne forever and ever. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling, saying, This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned, for I have desired it. I will bless her with abundant provisions. Her poor I will satisfy with food. I will clothe her priests with salvation, and her faithful people will ever sing for joy. Here I will make a horn grow for David and set up a lamp for my anointed one. I will clothe his enemies with shame but on his head will be adorned, but his head will be adorned with a radiant crown. God add his blessing to this word. Please be seated. Last week, as we looked at Psalm 120 and 121, the two opening songs of the Psalms of Ascents, we saw how they can remind us that we're watched, or, or rather watched over, by God, that we need to lift up our eyes to him instead of the challenges around us in our circumstances or looking instead of looking to the false helps of this world. So this week we're considering three psalms from this collection that praise the city of Jerusalem where where these uh, worshipers were going to. They praise Jerusalem and Mount Zion and the temple. The writers are joyful at being able to go to the house of the Lord, and there have been a lot of songs written based on that. They celebrate that God chose Israel as his people. They celebrate that he chose Jerusalem as the place for his name to dwell, and they celebrate his choosing of David and his house as rulers over his people. You know, it occurs to me, this can be kind of a touchy subject for us as Christians, God's choosing. There's been a lot of disagreement and a lot of church division and a lot of, honestly, personal anxiety over this idea. And it basically boils down to this. Does God choose people to be saved or do we have free will to choose him? And you know, the testimony of scripture is abundantly clear. Yes. We see in the Bible that God is completely in control of history. He accomplishes his will from the course of nations to the purposes of individual lives. Hannah sings in 1 Samuel, the Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. When writing about Paul and Barnabas' missionary work, Luke says this in the book of Acts, When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. And Jesus himself says, All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. 
God is in control of life and death and the circumstances of our lives, and people are appointed for eternal life. We cannot seek him unless he draws us. But at the same time, Joshua tells the people of Israel, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now dwell. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. In many places, Jesus and the writers of the New Testament call on people to repent, to turn from their sinful ways and choose to follow God. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He says of a false teacher in the book of Revelation, I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. Come to me, all of you. I have given her time to repent, but she is unwilling. God gives an open invitation, an opportunity for people to choose. God is perfectly in control, and we have the ability to choose. How does he do that? How does he maintain his sovereignty and our free will at the same time? I don't know. I'm convinced that he shows us that both of those things are true, and it causes a short circuit for us. Our little brains can't fathom how both of those things could be true at the same time, how he could do that. But he is omniscient and omnipotent. He knows everything, and he can do anything. So we are called to trust that he can and that he will do what is right. As we read in Deuteronomy 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. Our responsibility isn't to try to figure out the secret things. It's certainly not to fight with other believers about which side of it to emphasize. And the point of this mystery isn't for you to get all anxious about whether God has chosen you or doomed you to destruction. If you are following Jesus, if you have claimed his death in your place on the cross and have hope for eternity in his resurrection, you have been called. You have been chosen by God. As Peter says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. God doesn't call us to dwell on whether we are chosen, but what he does call us to consider, and what these psalms that we read today help us to see, is what we're supposed to do since we are chosen by God. Where is our focus? I'd like us to look at three pairings that help us to think about our focus as chosen ones. So our focus on a place or people, on power or peace, and on privilege or purpose. And yes, they all start with P's. It's a sickness. I'm trying to get help for it, but there's nothing they can do. Now, these are not bad and good. In each pair, both of these are true. The question is where our focus is, what that means for our minds, our hearts, and our actions. So first, do we focus on God's choosing a place or his choosing people? As God brought his people out of Egypt, he told them not to follow the religious practices of the people in the land of Canaan, where he was taking them. They worshipped with all kinds of strange and immoral rituals on high places throughout the land. Instead, God chose a particular place to be the center of their worship, a place where they could bring offerings and follow him in the way that he instructed them. We looked at part of Psalm 122 earlier, 
And verse 4 says this about Jerusalem. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. God chose Zion as the center for worship, as the dwelling place for his name. But the problem was that the people of Israel came to focus too much on the place. They thought that since God had chosen the place, they were secure by simply living in it. The danger, of course, in this kind of thinking is that it leads to us trying to control God instead of acknowledging his control. It leads to isolating ourselves instead of including others. And it leads us to complacency instead of growth. All too readily, the people forgot the words of Psalm 125, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. God's choice of a place didn't mean that the people could surround God, keep him in a box. It meant that he surrounded them. They didn't control him. He was in control. The temple wasn't a magic charm bringing good luck to Israel regardless of what they did, regardless of the conditions of their hearts. The prophet Jeremiah warned the people about this kind of magical thinking reminding them that their hearts and their actions mattered. He said, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Focusing on the place led Israel to exclude others. They oppressed the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. They pursued violence, and they followed idols. They grew complacent. Instead of allowing the Spirit of God to work in their lives, to change their hearts and their actions, they failed to look beyond themselves, to see the powerless who needed help, the lost who needed to know God. It strikes me how just this past week this is brought into such stark relief. There's a lot that I don't agree with the Pope about, but I thought it was significant, and I agree with him when he called out in our country those who would seek to dehumanize foreigners and immigrants and those who would seek to dehumanize the unborn. We need to be concerned about the powerless. We need to be concerned about following God and his holiness. Centuries later, Jesus was talking with a Samaritan woman. By the way, a foreigner, a woman, one who had been promiscuous. There was a lot going on in that conversation. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. A time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. With the birth of the church and the destruction of the Jewish temple, God made it clear that our focus was never to be on the place, on a nation or on a building, but on people. It can be tempting to hitch our faith to the place and the culture where we live. It's tempting for us to get caught up and isolated in our church buildings. 
so easy, isn't it, to turn our focus inward, to ignore the needs outside these walls. It's so easy to get complacent, to box God away in a place where he doesn't affect the rest of our lives. But he wants us, individually and corporately, to live as his chosen people, to worship in the spirit and in truth, to pursue lives of holiness and righteousness, to love one another well, and to extend that love to our neighbors who haven't darkened that door yet. So we need to ask if our focus is on a chosen place or on living as chosen people. We also need to ask if being chosen by God causes us to focus on power or on peace. And again, this isn't good, bad, or either or. As the people of God, we have received the power of God. Jesus told his disciples at the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts, I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Paul says later, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. The problem comes when we start thinking that this power is based on something about us, when it's all about God. God reminded the people of Israel that he had had not chosen them because they were more numerous than any other people, or more righteous, or had greater integrity. He chose them because of his promise to their ancestors and because of the great plan that he was accomplishing in history to restore us to himself. When we focus on getting power because we're chosen, the power of this world becomes all too tempting. Psalm 125 contains a warning. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous, for then the righteous might use their hands to do evil. We need to be careful not to seek earthly power at the expense of integrity. It's not hard to find politicians who court Christians, who pepper their speech with religious language, but their lives reveal something else altogether. Character matters. And the psalm writer knew it's a short path from excusing wicked rulers to becoming wicked ourselves. So instead... Instead of focusing on power, we need to remember that God's power enables us to be people of peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and in him we can know true peace. Before his arrest and his crucifixion, he told his disciples, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I don't know about you, but I need to hear that today. We can know the power of his peace no matter our circumstances. Whether we have earthly influence or whether we're facing reminders that we're strangers and aliens in this world, he has overcome. And through his peace, we can be peacemakers. Psalm 122 closes with a powerful direction, a powerful example of how we can pray for peace. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. We need to pray for peace and we need to seek peace because we are chosen of God. So we need to ask if being chosen causes us to focus on a place or on people? Are we focused on power or on peace? 
And finally, are we focused on privilege or on purpose? Now, it's true. Being chosen of God is a great privilege. You and I are called sons and daughters of the Most High. We are children of the King. We need to remind ourselves of that. When the enemy of our souls attacks with lies that I'm worthless, that I can't be forgiven, that my past or my brokenness disqualifies me from God's love. We need to remind one another that those are lies. The reality is that Jesus loved you and me enough to die for us so that we could be set free. But the risk in focusing too much on just our privilege as those chosen of God is that I can put the emphasis again on me instead of on him. I can look for how I can benefit instead of how God is calling me to benefit others. As Paul says in Galatians, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. God calls us not to use our privilege as his chosen ones to gratify ourselves, but to enter into his work in the world. Psalm 132, you might have noticed, it focuses a lot on God's choosing of King David, a man after God's own heart. God gave him a glimpse of God's plans in the world. Not only that he would give David a dynasty, but that through David's line would come the ultimate anointed one of God, the Messiah, Jesus. You know, Pastor Adam on Wednesday nights is walking through the life of David with us. And this past week as he started, he was talking about David's anointing by Samuel. And then we looked at how David faced his battle with Goliath. And you know, something really stood out to me about that as we were talking. King Saul said to David, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Now, I don't know about you, but if I faced a lion or a bear during my work day, that would be one of the biggest challenges of my life. It probably would be the last challenge of my life, if I'm honest. But David had the perspective to see that the lion and the bear were not ends in themselves. God didn't save David from them just to preserve David's life, just for David's own benefit. And in that moment before Saul, David saw his past struggles as preparation for how God was going to use him in the future. He could go up to that battle line against the Philistine giant in confidence because of the challenges God had already overcome in his life. So do you focus today on your privilege and only wonder when God is going to take that difficulty away that you're facing? When he's going to get rid of that lion or that bear? Or do you see your challenges as preparation? Trusting God that he can use even our suffering in his great plan. Do you just ask for an end to the struggles? 
Or do you ask how God wants to use them as a testimony, an encouragement, a ministering work to someone else? Are you focused on his purposes in your life? You might say, well, I don't know his purposes for my life. We talked about being peacemakers. The Hebrew concept of peace is not just a lack of conflict. It's wholeness, soundness, completeness. Psalm 132 says about God's peace for Jerusalem, I will bless her with abundant provisions. Her poor I will satisfy with food. I will clothe her priests with salvation, and her faithful people will ever sing for joy. How does God want to use you to bring his peace this week? As God blesses you, do you seek to satisfy the poor? As God has given you salvation, does your life demonstrate faithfulness to him? Does your speech reflect despair? Or do you sing songs of joy before others because you are his, whatever the world may throw you away? Do even your trials give you opportunities to encourage others? And friends, you and I are chosen of God. But let's not focus inward on a place, a building, a nation, a situation. Instead, let us focus on acting like his chosen ones, reaching out to others as we live out our salvation. Let's be concerned only with the power of God that brings peace, true peace. Let's not just focus on privilege as those chosen of God. Let's seek his purposes. And let's watch him bring his peace to our world through you and me.